minutes. Awesome. Thank you for that, Andrew. Um, cool. So uh, I guess we can just jump right into it. Um, so my first question for you is that like, I mean, I'm sure this is beyond obvious at this point, but like Stanford has like a super strong entrepreneurship culture, like even in the undergrad. Uh, so many of the people that you're probably looking at right now on the Zoom room um, are either pursuing or thinking of pursuing their own idea. So along those lines, we would just love to hear about your approach to evaluating startups. Like what are the things you look for in a potential startup? And what's the overall thesis that drives the investment decisions that you make? Yeah. So, you know, uh, the first thing I'd say is in doing anything extraordinary, and this is general advice to all students, you can't have rules. You, the more rules you have, the more you're going to end up constraining yourself to what others are doing. And that's a major factor and a major psychological difference. So my, my, my real answer is, I hope I don't have fixed rules. Having said that, evaluating the team and their openness and willingness to grow, both themselves and the scope of their team, may be by far the single largest factor. The second most important thing isn't the market, but the space. If it's a rich space, there's plenty of time then to iterate and evaluate and explore and find your way into a much larger market. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that that's, that's definitely very interesting. Um, so I guess like even thinking on like more of a personal level, like, I mean, when in your experience, at least with founders and everything, like what traits make a successful founder and are there any examples perhaps in your own life that you can just share with us that emulate this character? Well, there's many kinds of startups. So there isn't one kind of founder, right? So many people have built many businesses uh, with different kinds of founders. Um, I would say there's a lot of venture firms that are in the investing business. And that makes for, they're perfect for certain types of founders. I personally like to don't, I don't think of myself being in the investing business itself. In fact, uh, in the last almost 35 years that I've been doing venture capital, I've never called myself a venture capitalist once. And the answer is very simple. I like to work with ambitious founders trying to build ambitious companies. So if you want a low risk business, uh, there's probably a really, really good match in an investment firm for you. I much more like to imagine the possible and then no matter how difficult and then try and make it happen. And that's where the one constant is the team. You want the team to work with you. <clears throat> so uh, uh, it, it really matters. Uh, having said that, I like much more bold, ambitious visions. And anybody who wants to take a safer path out, or if you want to make 10 million bucks, and build a successful business, which you know, for most of your audience is probably a really great outcome. They should do that, uh, and but they should find an investor that's compatible. If you want the, to change the world with the breakthrough climate technology, that's not the you know. Give you an example. We started by Commonwealth Fusion Systems. I mentored the team um, at the MIT Plasma Fusion Lab into building a fusion reactor startup. Now, anybody would say the probability of failure is very high. And I say, if there's a 90% chance of failing, that's okay. If there's a 10% chance of changing the world. And that's my attitude, but it's not the right one for most startups, right? Nobody, you know, most of your 
team may not be comfortable listening in there with a 90% probability of failure. Now, the real fact is uh, well more than 50%, probably 70, 80% of startups fail anyway. Trying to do more conservative things, the only thing they do is they reduce the risk of failing, but make the consequences of success inconsequential mostly. And, and look, low risk startups make total sense from the entrepreneur's perspective in many, many cases. Uh, I, it's just not compatible with my, what I want to work on. Uh, I, I like things that may have a higher probability of success uh, or failure, but make the consequences of success really consequential. But it's a personal choice and there's no right or wrong answer in this spectrum of risk versus reward. How much do you shoot for the moon? It's just making sure whoever you get to invest in your startup is a match for what you want to do. Absolutely. I, and I'll give you a very simple example from my own background. I was going to ask about that. <laughs> I, was, I was probably right out of the GSP a, a little bit. Uh, at Sun, we could have picked two different paths. Build a graphics terminal add-on to any computer, deck waxes being the most common ones. And that'd be a low risk market. And we could have done that. We chose to go after obsoleting DAC, which we successfully did. We took the much higher risk path, but that was because that was the founder's personal preference as opposed to the lowest risk path. Every student who wants in, your, in this audience who has a, has a choice of which risk reward spectrum they wanna be in. And they, but my only suggestion is be explicit and about what you're trying to do and what you want. Absolutely. I think that that's super interesting, definitely. And I mean, just taking a look at like maybe the negative side of this, you've kind of talked about like how ambition and others traits in that area might be quite positive for different types of entrepreneurs. I was thinking what your take was on some of like the most, I don't know, like the most poor traits, like some of like the biggest mistakes that founders make and that you think could be avoided. Well, the biggest mistakes founders make is clearly not what they know, not their area of expertise. It's not even what they don't know. It's what they don't know they don't know. And the biggest gap is not building the teams to go address the issues they may not know they don't know. And so I have a, a blog I have on our website. It's maybe 10 years old called Engineering the Gene Pool of a Startup. If you're going to do a startup, absolutely read that because it helps you say, how do you build your starting team? Uh, and it's important to engineer that team for the risks and for the upsides of your opportunity and people who bring things that you don't understand because no founder understands all aspects of a business. Um, and most people, most founders focus on their asset. I really know this area. I'm a great roboticist or I'm a great chemist on inventing a new carbon capture technology, uh, but they don't know what else is needed and a chain fails at its weakest link. So, as much as you consider your strengths and you pitch that, put that in your pitch deck, spend an equal, maybe larger amount of time in all the ways in which you could fail. Ask a hundred experts how you could fail, not how you could succeed. So you can build a business plan that minimizes the impact of your liabilities, of your weaknesses. Keeping in mind a startup only has to fail at its weakest link, not its strongest link. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, in that sense, like when a person is first starting out, like I think that a lot of entrepreneurs in this group, 
have not probably started a business before. So in that sense, like, how do you know, how do you find out what you don't know you don't know? Like, is it just like, how do you find that create a great team that are able to help you answer those questions? Yeah, this, uh, it's almost a schizophrenic personality you need. You need extreme confidence to attempt unreasonable things. And, and that's what really great startups are about. Try something unreasonable. But at the same time, you have to be almost paranoid. Andy Grove, who's one of my heroes, wrote a book in the 1980s called Only the Paranoid Survive, and I suggest everybody read it. Uh, and you look for all your liabilities, right? And you be paranoid about every little thing. Um, it's this schizophrenia between having confidence in your vision, but also collecting all the input from everybody who will critique you. In fact, that critique is way more valuable than the people who say, you're doing a great job, this is a great idea. The hypocritical politeness you get from that will often mislead you. So the more people say good things about what you're doing, the more wary you should be and seek out the people who will tell you why it might fail because that's hugely valuable. And if you know why it can fail, you can engineer around those failures. Absolutely, yeah. I think that too often, like a lot of startups must be hearing like kind of an echo chamber, just kind of reinforcing their own views. Yeah, echo chambers and hypocritical politeness around plans is too common and it really, really hurts entrepreneurs. That's why I say one of our religious beliefs is uh, brutal honesty over hypocritical politeness. Um, even when we reject something, I'm happy to tell an entrepreneur why, why I'm rejecting it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that should be really valuable in them iterating their plan or thinking about it. Um, yeah. Or at least considering all the criticism very actively. So open-mindedness becomes a key characteristic of entrepreneurs. Conviction at one end in your plan, but open-mindedness about all the failure points and all the tactical changes that might make sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that will change gears there uh, to a different, slightly different topic. Um, so now I think a lot of people are just wondering like now, like while we're in school, like what are like the best things that we can do to kind of set us up to be great future entrepreneurs? And like, what is your top career advice that can potentially set us up for success that we can do right now? Well, the one easiest thing to do is read a lot about the startup ecosystem, which anybody interested in startups uh, does anyway. Uh, read as much about why startups fail in your area. Because finding all the failure points is what lets you succeed. And then understand what your risk profile is. Look, Absolutely. if you're in later, in, uh, later in your life, you have three kids in college, you can't afford to take certain risks. Um, I, I, when I graduated from school, I was very clear. I literally told my venture capital investor, hey, this is a great deal. I just not only recently come from India before graduate school. I said, this is a great deal. If we win, we win. If we lose, you lose. Because the only thing I could possibly lose was my student loans. I had nothing else to lose. It was a really liberating feeling because I didn't care about failure. Yeah, I think that's-, that's I literally definitely... told him, if we win, we win. If we lose, you lose. <laughs> if I have to declare bankruptcy, I lose my student loans, but nothing else. I didn't own anything. I didn't own a house, didn't. Yeah, absolutely. The benefits of being in college during this time. <laughs> there you go. Um, awesome. So I guess one question I was also wondering, um, and I think that a lot of people kind of come into college, especially um, to school like Stanford and kind of wonder this, is that like, does what you study in school actually end up affecting how good of an entrepreneur or founder you can be? Like for myself, like I come from a very technical background and I constantly wonder if that's the best way to go. And like, I 
or if I should be like trying to get an education in like another field like business, which is perhaps like more directly applicable to the sense of like making money um, or if whether just going technical and just picking up the business side along the way is the way to go. Look, most of business is common sense. You don't need an MBA. In fact, very often technical founders make the mistake of adding a business person to their team and they'll add the wrong person just to have a business person. And that may be the reason I pass on an opportunity. Uh, I'd rather have an incomplete team than a poorly constituted team. Much prefer an incomplete team to a poorly constituted team. Um, and that's really important advice. In fact, there's a question in the chat uh, that I'll answer, uh, which says, how do you balance not wanting to start a company with your friends with needing to know and deeply trust your co-founders and team members? Um, I think generally it's a mistake to start a company with your friends. Um, you want in a team as much diversity as possible. Usually when you pick your friends, they're probably in the same department, doing the same subjects and, uh, and you're not diversifying the experience. So I go back to that article about engineering the gene pool of a company uh, and say, pick the team that minimizes the risks and maximizes the diversity um, of the experiences of the team. Um, I'll come back to another point about experience. Uh, be sure to ask me. That's the way to constitute the right starting team. Uh, having said that, entrepreneurship, you know, it, in the press is glorified a lot. If you talk to your typical entrepreneur, it's a very, very hard road. It's depressing very often. It's lonely very often. When you're failing and churning at night and can't sleep. That's why in 86, I wrote uh, a, a startup uh, presentation. Back, back in those days, they were on overhead foils. Now there's a PowerPoint version of, of it on our site um, called the Entrepreneurial Roller Coaster where the highs are high, but the lows are low. And there's some really depressing times and that's where it helps to have a friend on the team. But no, you're giving up some diversity of experience in the founding teams and having psychological support is very valuable then. Uh, in fact, uh, we are investors in a company called Ginger and the founder just uh, in the last few days wrote a blog about how hard and depressing it can be. Uh, and it's worth reading for any founder, the ginger.com ginger blog that came out just three years ago, written by its founders, where they agreed with VCs, where they thought they, were, they had to hide stuff from VCs. It's an unusually frank blog about all the pivots, how they failed for four years before they really succeeded. And now they're succeeding really well, but all the twists and turns and MVPs and pivots and all the things you hear about and relationships with VCs and all that. So that's a long answer to this question of should you start it with friends, but also how you engineer the founding team, get some advice. Now, let me give one other piece of warning. Certain amount of experience in starting a company is a good thing. But you fundamentally have to recognize that what experience is, is a bias. When you're doing brand new things, experience brings bias that is bad for innovation. So startups with a lot of experience on board, this is good news to all fresh graduates, 
tend to revert to repeating the past and doing iterations of past. I call it extrapolating the past. And so you can turn a great idea into a decent one quite easily. Uh, if you are thinking from first principles, then, and, and your goal is not to extrapolate the past and do it slightly better, which is a good business by itself, but to invent the future you want to happen, then experience can be a real handicap, especially early. You know, nobody from GM or Volkswagen would have built a Tesla. Now, yeah. along the way, Elon hired lots of people from the auto industry, but they didn't drive the vision. So experience is very valuable in avoiding mistakes in the area, but it's really negative in radically innovating the area too. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I think that's awesome. I think we'll wrap it up with one more question in the fireside chat portion and then translation, uh, translate to the pitches. So um, just as like a closer, I mean, why should we as students be excited right now to go out into the world and invent things? I mean, what are you personally excited about as you look out in the world and like what can happen? I know that you have a lot of different experience in different fields, even through your education with like electrical engineering, uh, more of a biomedical side. So I was just curious as to like, what, uh, what do you think about this? Well, so I was an electrical engineer. Uh, I always believed even when I was 16, whatever I wanted to happen, I could make happen. Uh, I just sort of culturally grew up that way um, and, and was never afraid of taking the risk, especially when I had no obligations, uh, which is a good time to start things. Um, I, here, here's what I would say. Um, one can make almost anything happened. And the biggest advantage I had being electrical engineer, I started the first computer programming class in any IIT in India. Uh, and we've just formed a hobby club. So the first startup was 1971. Four of us started a computer programming club, uh, even though we didn't have access to computers. Um, then I started with three other people, the first biomedical engineering program in India, as far as I know. This when we are 16 and 17 in a very state in institution. Um, I still occasionally touch base with the professor. I got curious about the human body and said, after electrical engineering, I'll do biomedical engineering. So one, my one piece of advice as you're thinking about your education, the more diverse the education across more areas, the more likely it is you can think laterally and broadly. And that is incredibly valuable and very, very complementary to a deep PhD in some specialized aspect of the immune system. How do CD8 positive, CURD positive, immune cells behave. You can absolutely do a PhD in that and it's valuable, but the breadth is very valuable. Uh, that then gives you the ability to do a startup in a lot of different areas as opposed to just your area of expertise. By the way, I'm rambling. I forgot your question. Was, was there a specific question I didn't answer? Um, I was just curious about as to like specific spaces or maybe like fields that you see like I mean, that's ex particularly exciting right now. Okay, so I wrote a document I'd highly recommend everybody read about three years ago called Reinventing Societal Infrastructure with Technology. And I'm no, I know I'm going out over time. After I turned 60, most people in my MBA class were retiring, I'm 66 now. And I said, boy, I really find fields exciting, but what should I work on? And I said, ask the simple question, what part of the US GDP can I work on? Um, and as I looked, instead of finding an area of US GDP that was large enough to work on, 
I was shocked to discover in a month at my ranch, just sitting and thinking and hiking and riding, that there was no part of US non-governmental GDP that one couldn't reinvent. So there's a 50 page document on Medium about three or four years old that describes what is open for innovation. Uh, my point is the following to answer your question. There is no part of GDP that's not subject to radical innovation. I never thought before I started that you could innovate construction radically. We're literally 3D printing whole houses now. Um, nobody, I, I didn't think you could innovate in foods and impossible foods could free up 30 to 40% of this planet's land area if you got rid of animals. Yeah. Uh, so I'm saying whether it's food or construction or public transit, we have a new startup in public transit. Don't limit yourself into thinking only certain areas are open for innovation. Three years ago, everybody told me fusion is only for governments to do. I, I think we'll build the ITAR multi-government effort by about 50 years. Well, that's amazing. Five zero. That's crazy. Yeah. I think that's a great piece to leave it on, actually. I mean, that's that's super interesting. I think that's super cool. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, Vinod. Really appreciate it. Uh, super interesting to listen to. Let, let me just say one more thing to your students, which I okay. find Go inspiring. Most people I run into are not limited by what they can do they are almost always limited by what they think they can do. So let's go to the pitches. Awesome, great way to leave it. Uh, okay, so the first person pitching will be uh, Andrew Fang of uh, Omniscient Labs. So Andrew, if you wanna go, uh, you have two minutes and I'll be cutting you off in two minutes. So uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. All right, perfect. All right, hey Vinod, thanks for the time. I'm Andrew with Omniscient Labs and we're building back end object detection for military imagery analysts. After talking to over 200 end users and stakeholders across the military and intelligence community, we learned that tens of thousands of analysts spend the majority of their time looking at overhead images to monitor objects. It's time consuming, prone to analysts missing things, and it's a serious bottleneck. It's also insufficient to exploit the rapidly increasing volume of imagery collected, which our CEO Nick experienced firsthand as a military intelligence officer and knows is a process stuck in the 1960s. Our competitors can't identify specific subclasses like different aircraft models, and they're planning to sell bulky platforms that need wholesale adoption, resulting in resistance by users with established workflows. Our solution doesn't force analysts to learn new software nor change how they operate. Instead, we scan imagery and output fine-grained detections directly into existing analyst tools, uh, which enables us to operate significantly quicker and cheaper. Uh, so far, we've been using unclassified satellite imagery focusing on aircraft, and we're planning to expand to other use cases and sources soon. Our extensive backgrounds in military intelligence and computer vision makes our team uniquely suited to tackle this opportunity. Our CEO, Nick, a GSP student, spent five years in the Army as an intelligence officer, is working to solve the inefficiencies he experienced firsthand. John, our CTO, is a computer vision expert. He was the head TA for Stanford's Deep Learning course. He TA'd the computer vision course. He did research with Stanford Machine Learning Group and graduated from his Stanford uh, CS Masters last year. My background is in creating and building novel computer vision, uh, computer vision product at Samsung and working on defense tech at Andoro. Last week, we were awarded a $50,000 contract with the Space Force uh, with the potential of getting a $1.5 million follow-up contract in August. We're currently working with stakeholders in the Air Force and also across the Department of Defense. Ultimately, our vision is to build US military omniscience. Yeah, that's it. Uh, thanks so much for listening. I love to hear what you have to say or if you have any questions. Well, so, uh, a couple of things. You, your team seems to be appropriate for the task you picked, right? You have the problem definition, which is the military analyst on your team. You have the vision recognition, but you also have something else that's absolutely a really good thing to engineer into any startup. Whatever you do, the rest of the world will make with deep learning and we are large investors in open AI, uh, it'll make the technology move further and further up the ladder very, very quickly. So you, you not only will make progress because your technology is making progress, 
but you leverage what the rest of the world is doing. And, and so, as I like to say, swimming on the ocean is hard and you can swim, but when there's a large wave, you can go much further surfing the wave. And you might be surfing the waves, wave of rapid progress in vision and AI. So uh, surfing somebody else's wave is always a good thing in a startup. It propels you much further than you can swim on your own. So those are the good things. What would I critique the plan for? You always have to say, who's the customer? In this case, the defense forces. Do I really want to sell to them? In general, I don't like selling to government entities. Um, now, other people may, and they have a lot more expertise in that, but it's an issue. You have one type of customer, you have lots of classified stuff, you have unusual export controls, those kinds of things in these kinds of military applications. So one customer is the large risk. It can be a large customer, but in the end, you may limit the total size of your opportunity by having the government as your main customer, or the military as your main customer. No question, it's a hard problem. No question, it needs to be solved. Now, I happen to believe that every single camera, five to 10 years from now, will output not video, but semantic information. There's a lady in a red dress. If you do face recognition, this is Samantha Jones. Uh, it will output semantic information, not video. I'm almost certain of that. Uh, and if we don't do it, the Chinese will be doing it. Um, uh, in fact, it's, it's, this is not a technical risk to have semantic information uh, flowing out a text description flowing out of any camera instead of just video. The video will just be back up. Awesome. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll move on. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for note. Um, OK, so next up is Anand with Cardinal Robotics. So Anand, you have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vinod, for your time. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Hi, we are Cardinal Robotics and we are reinventing the way disinfection happens. In the pre-COVID and post-COVID world, disinfection is a huge aspect, especially when it comes to hospitals and uh, public places. Our current competitors are incredibly expensive and they generally rely on trolley style system or are outside the budgets of most places. We partnered with OmniLabs, a robotic company and built our first MVP that is a lot cheaper, modular and easier to operate with telepresence robotics. We won the Stanford Medical Contest and they're investing about 150K and we're trying to deploy and the hospital itself. Uh, Target bought our first three robots a few months ago and we are actively expanding our use cases within the Target ecosystem. And we are currently piloting with the Minnesota Airport and the Walker Methodist Nursing Home in Minnesota. We have gone through the bacteria testing with the FDA approvals and have been able to prove a four log reduction in the most high touch areas such as restrooms, elevator bays and cafeterias using a third party independent micro microbiology lab. And our most important partner is our industry partner, Marston. They are a 10,000 person company who provide the boots on the ground. We train their people to go in, use our robots and actually sanitize places for their clients. They help us with our customer acquisition and with our deployment. Our team consists of myself. I'm a PhD student in electrical engineering focusing on photonics. Javen Shu, she has finished her master's in CS in AI and robotics and worked for four years in finance industry. Daniel Kuzinski has worked for the past eight years as a product director at Target and in other places and was a guest lecturer at Stanford. The three of us met three years ago and have worked on various projects since, including selling $50 million worth to Target and to other customers from the churches to IoT spaces. Okay. So my quick impressions, and, and I apologize, I'll give you pros and cons for every plan I look at. Mm -hmm. Just give you my best thinking because I do think um, the the cons are import, as important or more important than the pros. Again, robotics will get better dramatically because of AI over the next 
three to five years. Uh, and in fact, we have efforts in a company called Vicarious, mm -hmm. which is doing AGI approach to robotics, not AI approach to robotics. And I won't go into the differences, but the ability to rapidly learn new situations. Um, clearly large need, clearly labor intensive, very hard to do it right, very hard to examine stuff under UV light and all that kind of stuff, or UV sanitize every niche and corner, every doorknob, every handle. Uh, so definitely an opportunity. Uh, two diverging things. If you define hospitals as your targets, the environment is relatively definable. Mm -hmm. They have patient rooms and nurses stations and sort of the areas you need to sanitize are well-defined. So it's easier to get started with more automated robotics in that area. That's a good thing. Two problems. Um, one, hospitals are incredibly bad customers. They take a long time to make decisions and they're financially driven. And I hate to say it, but if one of their patients gets an extra infection, it's an extra day, a hospital bed, it's extra revenue for them. It's because of the nature of our system, avoiding infections, they'll say is a really good idea, but they may not love it financially because they actually lose money because they lose a, you know, an extra infection keeps the patient in the hospital and that's extra $10,000 a day. So thinking about incentives is very, very important. Um, if you say we'll go to target stores, then you have this much harder problem of, much more varied environment. So robotics is much harder to generalize. And, and so you have this push and pull between where's the technology and which markets can be addressed. Um, the, the other thing I would say is I'm always wary of any startup that relies on any large company for a partnership. Most entrepreneurs think large partnerships with an organization that has 50,000 people creating infection, disinfecting hospital rooms is a good idea. I almost always hate partnerships because they slow you down. When you're starting up, and this is my personal preference, there's plenty of venture capitalists who prefer a partnership, but I don't like partnerships or like startups who can control their disruptive price points. Uh, if an organization is taking you into a setup, they, they're not gonna disrupt their price points because that's disruptive of their revenue. Um, that's how I think about it. Now you can use it to enter in hospitals, get your system ready and then go directly. Uh, partnerships generally don't work for startups. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much for note. Uh, with that, we'll move on to Diva um, with Bird Your Pay. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, can you see it? But no? Yes. Awesome. Yes. I'm going to start now. I'm an undergrad from India, and I'm extremely concerned by the problem of healthcare affordability in the United States and the fact that major medical financing companies are taking advantage of patients who are in fact turning to them to get high interest rate medical credit cards as well as installment loans. And one of the key players in this industry that's been around since the 1970s is in fact hair credit that is both predatory and also enjoys consolidation due to its uh, market share from back then. Um, offering deferred financing with interest rates as high as 27% when patients least expect it and has poor ratings as well as just uh, just a poor interface and lack of personalization. But outside of that, out-of-pocket spending in the United States is so large, it's nearly $405.6 billion a year. 
And these medical financing companies clearly haven't been able to innovate in this space uh, by offering everyone the same payment terms as well as not being upfront about their offerings. So we're actually looking into the out-of-pocket financing space to offer patients the opportunity to pay for the expenses out of pocket by creating Word Your Pay. So Word Your believes investing in your health is worth it. It's a financial services tech platform that provides a transparent, patient-friendly and intuitive way for people to manage their out-of-pocket expenses. We're solving both the financial and distribution problem by working with consumers and providers, private practice, as well as both an emergency and elective procedures to offer short and long-term installment loans along with other personalized offerings. But most importantly, over the past six months, we've proven the market an idea with consistent discussions with prominent banks that work with Lending Club, a firm and other major FinTech lending companies to become a banking partner, as well as obtain a mortgage license through that system as well as conducting extensive case studies with current and former leaders of companies like SoFi to vet this idea, as well as major private practices to ensure, and we know this is a real need. But beyond that, uh, Mr. Costa, thank you so much for your time. And I think that we were very aligned on our interest in disrupting healthcare, but also disrupting inefficient monopolies while creating a credible path to grow. So it would be wonderful to explore a partnership with you and other partners like Mr. Justin Kyle at Costa Ventures to see how we can enable every American to be able to invest in their health without being, without having that, the, without suffering from not having that peace of mind while financing their care. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, so important, another really important area and a very big area. So when I say be in a rich space, you are in a very rich space because the market is large. Now, what does it take to succeed, we didn't have enough time to talk about the background of your team, but there's a lot of grunt work in getting connected with all the hospital systems and all the people who need to get paid uh, and, and the self-pay element. Uh, and you didn't talk about how much you understand that, but the single biggest thing you have to do is assess risk. What did, you're basically in the lending business and it's hard in a two minute pitch to tell me how you assess risk. But you mentioned a firm, we, are the, we were the first investor in a firm. So I know that entity really well. And they decided to discard credit scores and say, we will do a much better and much more fine-grained risk score for every consumer. And when they wanna buy, we can do it in 30 seconds. That was the original premise. Now, if you can do it, great. But if you can't, and that depends on your team, uh, you're gonna be at a disadvantage. Uh, part of the lending in this area is clearly predatory, but Part of the reasons for why it's predatory is because if they can discriminate good borrowers from bad borrowers, their loss rates are high, so they have to charge a lot. And hence, they have to be predatory. Um, if I were you, the risk I would worry about, and I know we are running out of time, the risk I'd worry about the most is why shouldn't a firm do it itself? Yeah. Uh, Vinod, awesome. Thank you so much. I see what we're at time. Uh, we actually have one more startup. Are you like, are you busy right after this or would you be willing to stay for like a couple It'll be of really good. It'll be so good. Yeah, no, I'm happy to do one more startup. Okay. I know we awesome. signed on for. All right. We really, 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 really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, Ananya uh, with Green Ends. Hi, thank you so much for coming in and chatting with us. I know everyone really appreciates it. So plastic pollution is a big, big problem. It's on track to triple in our oceans by 2040 and 90% of plastics aren't recycled. Um, so at Green Ends, we're building new materials for a sustainable future. Um, let me close off my virtual background so you can actually see. Great. So this is my lunch. I picked it up today at the dining hall. And the bag that it's in is our Green Ends bag. And it looks like regular plastic, except it's not made up out of plastic at all. I have like a little snippet of the, the plastic bag because I need, I'll take a bigger one because I need that one for my lunch. And our bag, so this is hot water. Um, I don't know if you can see well, but yeah. it dissolves in hot water in a minute. It's, it'll be almost done. 
And then if it's not in hot water, it'll biodegrade in the ground in 60 days completely. So, and, and it dissolves not into um, like microplastics, but rather monomers that dissolve into nutrients. Uh, the bag is actually edible and um, drinkable, approved by the FDA, though not recommended. Um, currently we're in pilots with, we're starting a pilot with Stanford, um, talking to uh, Microsoft, a few senior homes in Toronto, where I'm from, um, and a few companies to get their feedback um, and grow from there. So yeah, would love your feedback. As Great. Well. Um, another very large social problem, uh, uh, plastics, uh, waste plastics is a really hard problem. Um, and engineering, so people have done a lot of work in sustainable plastics like PLI. But the problem with those is they're not biodegradable. So you need biosourced and biodegradable. And frankly, the biodegradable part is more important than the biosourced piece. If you look at it at a global environmental point of view. Um, and plenty of people are trying to uh, engineer biodegradable. And it really means taking these polymers and attaching attack points for bacteria to whether it's polarized molecules or some degree of polarization attack points. There's a number of chemistry strategies to engineer attack points into a molecule, or especially a polymer. Um, you have a different solution. I'd never heard of a heat based solution. Um, so really good markets. Now, it's interesting. If you said to me 10 years ago, you want to do this? It was an important social problem, but no consumer cared. Um, thanks to your generation of consumers, it's become an impending problem. And there's a generation of people, uh, mostly under 35, who actually really would change what they buy because of the packaging it comes in. So it's, it's one of these startups which 10 years would, even with the same technical solution, wouldn't have been as attractive as it might be today. Um, the thing you have to think through is where do you get it adapted first and how large can those segments be? Um, that, that'll be the main issue. And then the question of what percentage of those people will throw it in the trash or, and what, will, what percentage will boil it and do something else with it. If you could find a use for it uh, as a dissolved substance, a monomer, then you might actually have higher uptake where people yeah, would actually- if it, even if it is thrown out in the garbage and it makes its way to a landfill, in the landfill, it'll biodegrade and be better for the environment regardless well, And that's, of that's the different solution of engineering microbial attack points into the polymer. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, um, cool. I guess we'll wrap it up there. Uh, so yeah, uh, we're a bit over time. So we really appreciate you sticking around and uh, yeah. Thank you so, so much for being with us uh, here today. It's just super valuable to hear and listen to all your, um, all your advice for everyone. And yeah, to everyone else, uh, thank you for coming as well. We really appreciate you coming out on Zoom and look out for future events uh, from ACES going forward. So yeah, uh, I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you everybody and a good evening. This is always fun talking to students who wanna start companies. So thank you, bye-bye. Awesome, all right, thank you everyone. Bye-bye.